Hello everyone and welcome to our first official episode since we partnered with the RPM Network. We are so honored and thankful for RPM's interest in our show and excited for That Was History's future. This can only mean good things for us and we hope that this partnership will allow for bigger and better projects in the future for your enjoyment. With that said, we are still the same show and we will continue to bring you historical events and fun facts each week as we have always done. Enough with that though for now. We have some very interesting topics for this week, so let's go find out what this episode holds. When you go to the beach or a theme park, there's always that noise of cars humming down the road. Most of the time it can be noisy and it's sometimes hard to just relax without all the distraction. But what if there was a place that you could get away to that you could just shut off from all the traffic and noise that this creates? Well, on April 13th of 1858, a heavy storm cut a channel through the peninsula of Ontario which would create the Toronto Islands. This is a big tourist area and the famous John Quinn's Peninsula Hotel was destroyed during the storm. Despite all the devastation from the storm, the island remains an attraction to this day. And a fun fact for you, the island comprises the largest urban car-free community in North America, though some service vehicles are permitted. Recreational bicyclists are accommodated on the ferries, and bicycles, quadricycles, and canoes can all be rented at the island for your pleasure as well. April 14th marks a very sad day in American history. It was Good Friday, and Our American Cousin, a play being performed at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C., was underway. Sitting in the presidential box was Abe Lincoln, who is considered to be one of America's greatest presidents due to his role in the resolution of the Civil War and other disputes. Unfortunately, on this day in 1865, President Lincoln would be assassinated by John Wilkes Booth. This event occurred just five days after Robert E. Lee surrendered the Confederate armies to General Grant. Booth, along with his co-conspirators, aimed to revive the Confederate cause by severing the continuity of the United States government. Lincoln's assassination was only part of a much larger plan to kill President Lincoln, Vice President Andrew Johnson, and Secretary of State William H. Seward. The plan ultimately failed when Seward was only injured and Johnson's assassin became unnerved and fled Washington. John Wilkes Booth was tracked down and killed on April 26th of the same year, and four co-conspirators, Mary Surratt, Lewis Powell, David Harold, and George Alzerot were hung on July 7th of 1865 for their part in the conspiracy. I want to encourage all of you to research this event further. What I mentioned was definitely only the tip of the iceberg, and there are many more interesting components dealing with this conspiracy for you to explore. World War II marks one of the greatest wars in our world's history. But do you know an area of land that played a crucial role in this great war? This crucial land was an island situated right in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, just under the southern tip of Sicily, called the Maltese Islands, and more specifically Malta. Due to its proximity to Axis shipping lanes, the Germans and Italians bombed the island on a daily basis, and they sunk any ships trying to supply food and medical supplies to the island. In the first 200 days of 1942, there was only one 24-hour period where no bombs fell. The Maltese people spent so much of their time in underground shelters that health standards declined, malnutrition spread all around, and scabies was rife. The island continued under siege with little food arriving right until May of 1943 when the siege of Malta was finally lifted. They were awarded the George Cross on April 15th of 1942 by King George VI to bear witness to the heroism and devotion of its people during the great siege it underwent in the early parts of World War II. The George Cross is woven into the flag of Malta and can be seen wherever the flag is flown. For many years, a large portion of humanity has been interested in the consumption of substances that will cause them to experience life and the world around them in a way that is far from the norm. For the most part, all of these substances fall into the category of illegal drugs. At least that's the case in the United States. Jeremy and I definitely do not condone illegal drug use or distribution, but we have always been curious as to how these drugs were discovered and developed. Seriously though, who was the first person who thought, hey, I'm gonna try this thing and smoke it and see what happens, or better yet, let me take this powder and suck it up my nose. Those both seem like good ideas, right? Thankfully, not all of these drugs were discovered intentionally. For example, on April 16th of 1943, Albert Hoffman accidentally consumed LSD-25, formerly known as lysergic acid dithylamide. 
The Swiss chemist was disturbed when he received unusual sensations and hallucinations after consuming the drug. He is now considered to be the first to synthesize, ingest, and learn of the effects of LSD, and in 2007 he was named number one in the Telegraph's list of top 100 greatest living geniuses alongside Tim Berners-Lee. He would later die at the age of 102 on April 26th of 2008. Have you ever played a game of pool? I myself used to have a pool table and thought of myself as being a very inexperienced player when it comes to this game. There are so many laws of physics, inertia, geometry, and so on that are involved in pool. If you hit the ball at just the right angle, you can make it do multiple things like putting backspin, curve, and whatnot on the ball. More often than not, I found myself asking what was it that I could actually be playing other than the standard game of pool. Well, a new variation of pool was invented on April 17th of 1875 called Snooker. It was played using a cue ball and 22 snooker balls. One white cue ball, 15 red balls worth one point each, and six other colored balls that were worth a different point score. You win in snooker by scoring more points than your opponent using the cue ball to pot in red and colored balls. A player wins an entire match when a certain number of games have been won. One version of events states that Colonel Sir Neville Chamberlain of the Devonshire Regiment was playing this new game when his opponent failed to pot in a ball and Chamberlain called him a snooker. It thus became attached to the billiards game, now bearing its name as inexperienced players were labeled snookers. The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere, a classic tale of a man and his horse that helped change the fates of many people's lives during the Revolutionary War. This event occurred on April 18th of 1775 when Joseph Warren told Paul Revere and others that British troops were headed for Cambridge by boat. From this information, we get the famous phrase, one if by land, two if by sea. The British hoped to capture Samuel Adams and John Hancock during this invasion, but were unsuccessful due to Paul Revere's efforts. With the help of men such as William Dawes, the militia along the land and sea routes were informed of the British troops' movement. Against popular belief, Revere did not yell, the British are coming. Instead, he shouted, the regulars are coming out according to eyewitness accounts. This alarm system was highly successful and allowed the militia to confront the British in Concord and run them back to Boston. So in a previous episode, we talked about music and how everyone has their own genre that they might prefer to listen to. One of my favorite things to do is go to a live concert to see my favorite artist perform. It's exciting and just something that you have to experience to get the full effect of. Well, in the shoes of the artist performing, you could imagine that they get up there and they're expecting the crowd to cheer them on and go wild that they're up there singing. What if the opposite occurred though? Wouldn't you think that they would be a bit confused? Well, on April 19th of 2004, the Canadian group Nickelback was performing in Portugal. They came out on stage as they normally do and started singing. Well, during the second song, the crowd, instead of going wild, singing along and listening, they booed them off the stage. They pelted them with rocks, plastic, and just about anything they could get their hands on. Soon after, the singer put down his guitar and asked over the mic if there was any fans out there for Nickelback. Have we got any Nickelback fans in Portugal? Are you sure? Up to you. You guys want to hear some rock and roll or you want to go home? I mean, this makes you wonder if they even knew before they came that Nickelback would be performing. If I don't like an artist, I definitely would not go to their concert. Well, that wraps up this episode, guys. Thank you very much for watching and supporting us since we began last year. Like I mentioned earlier, we have partnered with the RPM Network and have every intention of making the most out of this opportunity. This partnership would not even be possible without your support. If you enjoy our videos, please be sure to hit that subscribe button to keep up with our latest video and announcements. Also use the links below to follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. Be sure to come back next Friday.